Welcome back to another episode of Raven Conversations, the show where we talk about the news and happenings around the Washington National Guard, as well as in-depth conversations with the folks that make it all happen, you. So coming up later on today's show, we're going to talk with Colonel Kevin McMahon, who is the Director of Joint Operations here on Camp Murray for the National Guard. He and I and uh, Sarah Morris sit down with him and we chat all about the wildfire season, what's coming up, how we're going to prepare, how we mobilize, and uh, we even go into a little bit about the Senate bill that's uh, down in Olympia uh, that's proposed legislation about active, uh, state active duty pay. Um, so that's coming up on the show. This week was pretty busy uh, at the state capitol in Olympia where we have a couple of proposed legislation that are being heard at the state capitol. And these, um, these proposed bills uh, will directly benefit members of the Washington National Guard in a couple of ways. So um, Joe C. Mandel's here, and he is the state public affairs officer. Joe, what's, uh, what's going on uh, with these two bills? So we'll start with uh, Senate Bill 5197, because um, we, you know, we obviously have Colonel McMahon on later to talk about state active duty Correct, and yes. wildfires. So we'll talk Senate Bill 5197, which actually is the school pay. Um, so it, it, ref it immediately direct or affects, excuse me, Washington National Guard members that are in college, universities, some kind of vocational school, um, and actually is a state grant that will help pay tuition. So right now, members of the National Guard have federal tuition assistance on the Army side, GI Bill, they can take grants, they can take scholarships, um, but that always doesn't cover the cost of tuition. And so what this bill would directly do is make that cost, uh, would cover the rest of that cost, essentially making college 100% free to all members of the Washington National Guard. That's amazing. That is a huge <laughs> benefit. The state of Oregon passed something very similar last year. Idaho has a program as well. Um, and it does directly affect our members. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a tick in people on those border states of Idaho and Oregon uh, jumping over into those states because they can still serve in the Guard, they can still get the same federal benefits, and now they get a state benefit. So, so, so you have, we have folks that live in Washington who go into the Idaho Guard or the Oregon Guard specifically for this benefit. Yeah, I mean, if you live in a city like Spokane or Vancouver, and even the Tri-Cities or Walla Walla, yeah. uh, you've got units right across the, the state border. Um, and those, those states are, you know, same like us. They need, they need people in their ranks too, uh, good qualified guardsmen. And a benefit directly to them is, hey, we'll pay your tuition to your, uh, your university. And this right here is to basically make the same exact play in Washington State that your college education, your vocational school, your technical college, whatever it is you want to do, we can help make that 100 percent, you know, no money, you know, out of the member's pocket, all taken care of by either the federal government or the state government. Wow. Well, I hope that gets passed then. Yeah, that, that one is definitely a, uh, it, it, it does have some requirements though, got to be within good standings in the Guard. Um, you know, you can't, you have to be an active member of the Guard, actually drilling, mm -hmm. and you cannot already have a bachelor's degree. If you have a bachelor's degree or higher, you're not eligible. These are mm -hmm. for people going for that first degree. So those, those new members that are, are in college working towards that degree, or those members that are in the Guard that are working towards that degree. Um, but if you already have a, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, it, this won't cover that. You still have to use your traditional means, you know, GI Bill, tuition assistance, but this will help those first-time college degree folks. Nice. And what's the other bill? Uh, so the other bill um, is House Bill 1137, Senate Bill uh, 5196, uh, state active duty pay. This one is, is a big deal as well. Um, so the current statute that the state wrote back in 1989, so I believe it 30 <laughs> years ago, uh, said that Guardsmen would receive 1.5 times the federal minimum wage when fighting, uh, when, when called to state active duty. So fighting fires, floods, um, any kind of response. That has, um, <laughs> that, that 
seems like okay, a pretty good deal, 1.5 times the federal minimum wage. However, the state minimum wage is $12. Yeah. The federal minimum wage is seven eighty-five. Um, originally yeah. when wrote, there was a five cent difference. <coughs> now, guardsmen that are getting called out on state active duty or SAD, as a lot of them like to refer <laughs> to it, is uh, are only getting paid about $10.85. About a buck fifteen below the fed or the state's minimum wage, so what this would do, it would level that playing field. Guardsmen would get the state minimum wage or whatever amount is deemed equal to by the fight the National Fire Agency Coordinating Group, and it's whatever is higher, whatever okay. that greater amount is. So guardsmen that get called to state active duty to fight wildfires could ultimately end up making more than the state minimum wage for going out and fighting fires. And it would be equal to what the firefighters exactly. who work for DNR get paid. Uh, pretty close, pretty yeah, close. at that level. You know, yeah. I obviously have the senior DNR guys versus right. the junior DNR guys. But that, yeah, that's the intent is to make this a more level playing field for oh, those nice. folks who are out there doing the same exact work. Nice. So one of the, one of the big things I know you wanted to mention this, Jason, is every guardsman can get behind these things. Every guardsman that listens to this podcast today yeah. It's, it's as easy as pulling. I pull did it. my part. Yep. We, we both did our <laughs> part. We, we pull up our phone, ledge.wa.gov, L-E-G dot W-A dot G-O-V. You can find the bills. You can read about the bills. You can show support. You can support. pledge your support for the yep. bills. And yep. you can pledge your support for the bills. Um, I'm not saying you have to. It's up to you as a member. Uh, NGAW has been down there sitting right beside the, the adjutant general, Major General Brett Doherty. Every, every time he testifies, they're sitting right in the room next to him, mm -hmm. showing their support for the organization. Um, so just know that there are people down in Olympia fighting for us every day to make sure these things are getting taken care of. Nice. All right. Well, that's it for the news portion. Um, yeah, coming up after the break, we're going to talk with Colonel Kevin McMahon, who, is, uh, who will tell us all about... Uh, how we're preparing to fight wildfires uh, from now and in, into the future. Be sure to follow us on social media. Stay up to date on all the cool events, stories, photos, and videos happening around the Washington National Guard. If you have a question, have a comment, or just want to say hi, send us a DM, PM, tweet at us, whatever, and we'll answer you. We also love to share and collaborate. Send us the photos or videos you take at Drill or AT, and we'll tag you. Are you an active Instagrammer? Well, you might be a perfect candidate to take over our account. Send us a message, and we'll set something up. To find us, do a search for WA National Guard. That's WA National Guard, and look for the blue check mark. Washington is earthquake country. Are you prepared? Earthquakes can create a series of big waves called tsunamis. Do you know your evacuation routes or how long it takes to reach high ground safely? Learn how to protect yourself from a tsunami. Check with your local emergency manager or visit mil.wa.gov slash tsunami. Before disaster strikes, get two weeks ready. Make a plan. Build a kit. Become involved. Be a preparedness champion. Well, I just want to say thank you, first of all, um, for coming here. T we have today uh, Colonel Kevin McMahon, who's the Director of Joint Operations at the, the Joint Operations Center here on Camp Murray. So that means he has a good handle on what is going on around the state, emergency-wise and everything else. So um, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Recently, we've seen an uptick in National Guard service members being called up in our state yep. for not just wildfires, but for a lot of other um, emergency responses. Yep. So, um, but in particular, wildfires. My understanding is since 2014, we've had more than 4,500 guardsmen called up for supporting wildfires yeah, that's in one right. capacity yep. or another. Yep either fighting on the lines themselves or providing some type of support, whether it's a, a mechanic or a cook or mm -hmm. you know, pick a thing, it's an enabler, um, helping uh, those soldiers and airmen that are out fighting the fires. Um, can you speak to the history or, you know, the, the, the history we have of being called up for wildfires, like since? Um, sure. I, I can only go back so far, right. uh, but um, my recollection is that um, uh, first and foremost, so our aviation crews have been training and typically will get called out more so than our, our um, hand crews. Um, and so when I give you the data that I'm going to talk about, that's more about the hand crews because that's a, a little bit larger lift for the organization. Um, 
But the last significant call out that we had was in 1993 uh, when the state was burning down and we mobilized, um, I'm not sure what the total number of forces was, but it was, right. it was significant. Um, from that point in time, we've had maybe, you know, itty bitty um, events where we've been mobilized and supported wildland fires. But the real big push again was in 2014. Um, at that, that year, we mobilized somewhere around 800 service members, uh, whether they were physically on the fire lines or they were uh, enablers. Mm -hmm. And so from 2014 on has really become kind of the continuation of that mission um, to the point that uh, 2014 and 2015, we did not have pre-trained hand crews that could go out mm -hmm. and fight the fires. So we had to take about a week prior uh, to arriving to train those crews up and get them red card certified. Um, since 2000, at the conclusion of the 2015 year, we now have um, uh, at least 10 hand crews that are trained and ready to respond uh, at the needs of the Department of Natural Resources. And how many people are on a hand crew? So a hand crew is typically made up of, of 20 service members. Um, those members are what we refer to as red card certified. So they go through a 40 hour block of instruction where they learn how to do everything from how to cut a fire line, how to kind of watch what fire management looks like so that they don't put themselves in a situation where they can be hurt, how to deploy their emergency um, survival kits, uh, and then just how to use some of the basic equipment that's, that's typically found on a hand crew. Uh, but those 20 service members then uh, fall under the uh, responsibility of um, a crew boss, and that crew boss is uh, provided by the Department of Natural Resources that individual typically has 10 plus years of experience fighting fires, and so therefore they're, they're the ones that can really manage them and put right. them into use on the fire lines. And that makes them like equivalent pretty much to the civilian firefighters that are out there. I mean, not totally, but at least on the same. So they, they have all the same right. training requirements that a, a basic hand crew that's uh, you know out there for the entire summer has. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, they, otherwise we wouldn't be able to put right. them forward. Yeah, mm. that's cool. Yeah. Um, what's the difference between what we did back in 1993, 94 for Firestorm? Uh, the, the hand crews that were, out, or the, that were out there then to us now. Sure. I mean, like. So I can't talk too much to that because I wasn't a part of it. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, <laughs> I was at annual training at the time, so that my unit didn't get called for that. But in talking with um, some of the soldiers that were called out for it, it was, it was kind of like, hey, get on the truck. We're sending you to the Wenatchee area. And then when they got there, there's like, hey, there's a shovel, there's a pick, get out and go to the fire line. Um, so a little bit more wild, wild west mentality. Well, on the job training. A little on the job <laughs> training, yeah. um, which also kind of put our, our airmen and soldiers at right. risk. Right. Um, and so this, now we're a little bit more um, uh, directive in, in what we need and require of those service members. And we really follow suit from what DNR has established as the standards and the US Forest Service so that they can go out and safely conduct well by wildland fire management. And safety, I guess, that makes the safety just goes way up. It does. Yeah. 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 Not just like, hey you, you want to go fight a fire? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are we doing as an organization to help better assist DNR moving forward? Like, well, since 2014, but from here on out, sure. you know, what have we proactively done. Sure. So each year, um, and I usually refer to it in a calendar year, um, so we're getting ready in f this February, the aviation units will start training with uh, the DNR aviators to make sure that their bucket drops and their certifications are intact so that we can provide rotary wing assets to, to go fight fires. Um, you just can't take a crew, put them on an aircraft and expect them to, be, to know, you know how the bucket is going to impact the aircraft how to dip properly for water. So it's a, it's a process that they go through and basically are certified by um, the experts out of the Department of Natural Resources. In addition to that, we will then train up somewhere around 200 new red card certified individuals. Um, more than likely that'll take place during March and April timeframe. Um, and what that does is that helps us replenish a larger pool of individuals who are trained. Um, that red card certification is good for five years and, it, and like any organization, we have soldiers and airmen that were trained two or three years ago, and they've now ETSed out of the organization. Mm -hmm. And so we need to consistently refill that, that bucket so that uh, we have a ready force that can go out and fight the okay. hand crews. From that, then, um, 
the services have the capability then to, to, to go back and look at those individuals that are trained. We just recently published a joint tasking order that said, hey, Army, we need five hand crews for you for the 2019 wildland fire, and air, we need five hand crews from you as well. Um, in addition to that, the aviators are already tracking their requirements. And then the enablers really don't require the red card certification, um, but there might be individuals that if we need to get them to the lines, we can go back and look at who's trained and push them out to support whatever requirements are needed. But at the end of the day, our, our real requirement to DNR is 10 hand crews. Um, the agreement this year with DNR is that those hand crews um, really will be available starting 1 August. What we're trying to do is provide some predictability for our service members mm. right. so that you know June's usually our AT period. Right. Um, this past year in 18, we started providing some resources in late July. And we really want to allow about a month where our service members can know, hey, I can go on vacation with my family, I can you know go camping, so that the mm -hmm. whole summer's not wasted with them being in kind of a standby status. Um, so DNR has said, yep, right now from what they can see, there's really no need for the hand crews until um, August. Typically what we find is the hand crews get called somewhere around the beginning of September because that's when all of the college students that are on hand crews for right. the Department of Natural Resources go back to school. Um, so this past year in 18, it, it kind of caught us a little off guard because they came to us about a month earlier than they're, they're used to. Um, and so we were able to provide those resources fairly quickly because we'd already pre-trained them all. Mm. Okay. Let's go back to the aviation piece yep. for a minute. You said next month they're going to start training with uh, DNR aviation. Yep. So in, in the past, being public affairs, I often get to go out to some training, right, and get to capture some of that stuff. Sure. So we've seen aviators out at American Lake, you know, just dipping, picking up buckets, mm -hmm. dropping it off in the distance, coming back around, doing all that stuff. That was them getting, from what I understood, like up to speed or certified in bucket drops? That's correct. I don't recall there being DNR aviators or anybody they were training with at the time. So is this something new that the that they're doing in February coming up this month? So it's Next not month? new in the sense, uh, at least since 2014. Um, so the state aviation officer will coordinate with the aviation section out of the Department of Natural Resources. DNR will then send out a, an individual that will then certify our pilots and it's everything from, hey, you know, this is kind of the configuration that the aircraft should be in. This is what uh, historically is the okay. impact of the bucket on the aircraft before they even lift off the ground. Because right. you might have a, a new uh, a pilot that's never had a bucket underneath them. Um, and so they just kind of go through that process. In okay. addition to that, then there's the, the actual dipping itself. Um, you know, for us, for safety and for experience, the first time we don't want a pilot uh, dipping water out of some lake is on a fire. Yeah. Um, so we attempt to do that and make sure that everyone has been appropriately trained and understands the safety ramifications before we push them out in, in August and September. Yeah, I'm sure they got to practice how to release the water to make sure it yeah. gets on the fire. Because I know when I was talking to them, so they recently did a thing with Seattle Fire Department yep. and I was out there talking to the aviators and they were talking about how releasing the bucket is so critical but also so mysterious because the wind yeah. and which direction they're going and which way the fire is going and so it's really like there's a lot happening in their decision of like where to release the bucket yep. and how all of that goes into place. I'm sure that they like to practice that they do. as many times yeah. as possible. <laughs> and, and I've talked to crews that have gone out and, and they get a little frustrated at times because there's the civilian pilots that do that all summer long right. and they you know have said, you know, that civilian pilot's going and doing four drops when to, to their two or to their one right. just because the individual is more experienced because, the, again, they're doing it all summer. But they also, you know, have kind of chided that, you know, those, those civilian pilots, because of their experience, know exactly where to drop. Exactly. They can mm -hmm. kind of swing that bucket out and actually hit a yeah. target where our guys <laughs> just yeah. don't have, you know, they don't do it all the time, so they're not that proficient as, as compared to some of the civilian pilots that are out there. Yeah. I've seen some. I've seen some civilian pilots do some crazy stuff on those fires. I like, know. like they just like this really tight bank and yep. just let it go, and it just like disappears. The fire's it's gone. Incredible. It's incredible, and yeah. I can't even imagine the mechanics involved in trying to pilot a helicopter and drop yeah. a bucket on a specific right. piece of <laughs> land. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then there's the. The change of thought that you know a lot of the pilots are used to not having 
a cable swinging underneath right. them with you know 80 gallons of water. Exactly. So you got to also take into consideration power lines and buildings mm -hmm. and trees. Yeah. Uh, that historically they're like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm like as long as I kind of do treetop. So I'm you got to have a good crew. Yeah. I'd be telling you, uh, yeah. excuse me, <laughs> please go up higher. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, you also me mentioned the uh, the fact that we're getting hand crews trained up in earlier months. Mm -hmm. um, does that have any impact or effect on their annual training or the days of the year that soldiers are required to, you know, minimally train? Sure. What what is the effect of it? So I mean it. it obviously has a, uh, an effect because we're now asking an airman or soldier to come in for an additional five days above and beyond what's already forecasted for the year. Mm -hmm. Whether they're doing it 39 training days in the year or something bigger than that, like our 81st Brigade that's doing upwards of 50 plus training days just to train. Um, and so if they're coming in for the red card certification, again, that's a 40 hour block. We try to do that over the course of four days. Sometimes it has to be expanded to five. Um, but those soldiers are in a state active duty status. They are not in a federal status um, because we, for that mission, it, it, it's more appropriate for them to be in a, in a, right. in a state active duty status. Okay. So that's five additional days above the normal IDTs, above the annual training requirements that those individuals need to come in um, and, and do that training. What we've been able to do in addition to the red card training is there's an annual recertification. So once you're red card trained, before you go back out to the fire lines, we want to recertify everybody. That's an eight hour block of instruction. And to date, we've been able to do that during um, a, a drill weekend. Yeah. Um, the the uh, USPFNO has found that to be de minimis. Um, mm -hmm. So that's not overly reaching on the federal requirements. So there's no need to put them in a, in a sad status. Um, but we, again, ask the services, once you've identified who's going to be on your hand crews, that we make sure that those individuals go through a recertification course. Cool. Have you spoken and, and um, dealt with DNR officials in, in, in all these? Uh, oh, yes. So how, how has the conversations been going? Like, um, how have they been receiving our, our soldiers and airmen who are helping them out? I mean, do they love to have us? Do they... Sure. Are we getting in the way? <laughs> nope. Um, we've actually um, probably worked ourselves into a permanent job. Um, oh, okay. When you talk to DNR and to talk to some of the, the crew bosses, um, you've got some that have never worked with the, the National Guard, and therefore they're a little hesitant because, you know, fire is a dangerous job, and if mm -hmm. you're not really understanding who's, who's there to help you, you might be a little hesitant. But once the crew bosses have worked with National Guard forces, uh, what we have found is when our forces arrive, you've got crew bosses now fighting to get our hand crews on their teams, um, which, good, which a is a good thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, that is a good thing. Um, so, uh, you know, we've also been told at times that our, our soldiers and airmen, you know, work harder, cut fire lines faster, you know, are more aggressive than some of the other hand crews. And so, again, uh, really positive results and feedback that we've gotten from DNR related to, to our hand crews. That's they love us. Yeah. That's what I hear. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> So we're not just like the old, um, the old thing I, I used to hear is the, the firefighters hate it when the National Guard come out because we're taking their, their job, that, that kind of thing. So it depends, right? So uh, there's contracts that are in place that DNR executes with the civilian population or with civilian contractors. And at times when we get called, the only time we sh really should be called is when everything has been overwhelmed. Right. Contracts right. have run out. Mm -hmm. They're out of hand crews that they can bring in from other states. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear that, a lot of times it's like, well, you know, sorry, but uh, there's no other facilities or mm -hmm. resources available for us, uh, for, for DNR to tap into. Um, so we send out our, our services and, and help where we can. Um, on the flip side of that, this past year we, well not we, but DNR attempted to um, attack fires a little bit sooner than they have in years past. Um, years past, we would have these huge complex fires where two or three fires had burned together and we now have this massive right. fire that we're trying to fight. Um, DNR's new strategy is to attack the fires when they're smaller to, to contain them sooner. Mm -hmm. And so this past year in 2018, we executed that to where literally we had, you know, hand crews that got on a bus, got off at a fire camp and it's like, there's the fire, let's get after it. Um, 
And, and so there might be a little bit of that where, you know, hey, you're taking away jobs, but I don't see anyone else out there trying to attack the fire yeah. other than mm -hmm. our crews. So, you know, that's what we've been hired and trained to do. So yeah. we'll do it. Well, I don't know that much about wildfires, but so I did uh, move here in June, so I did experience the wildfire season, which for the first time, which was interesting. I was at Fort Lewis in 2007 okay. as a cadet. Yep. <laughs> uh, we did not have any fires that year when I was there, but um, I, did, uh, I didn't know anything about it. And then when I started uh, the job here in September, uh, it was sort of after fire season. So I just know that that there's just so much that goes into it. And will you just talk <coughs> about, I guess, the logistical, I, I don't want to call it a nightmare, but I'm sure it is one, of <laughs> that kind of movement? Is there, or do you guys have everything pretty much <coughs> pre-staged, pre-planned, ready to go? I mean, I know you have the hand <coughs> crews, but maybe talk about the enablers. Sure. Yeah. Um, so every year we learn something new when we fight a fire. Always. Because it's never exactly the same. Because it's fire, man. It's, it yeah. just does whatever it wants. <laughs> it does. Um, and so, for example, this year with uh, DNR, we were able to kind of forecast um, sizes and equipment okay. uh, so that we could uh, pre-position uh, caches that had uh, fire retardant clothing, the hand tools, the chainsaws, and all of that. <clears throat> and that worked very well for us last year. So we've already been discussing with DNR what that's going to look like. Um, they are actually building uh, caches for us that they will push to us probably sometime in May or June. And then we will push those to both Spokane um, and here at Camp Murray. Okay. Um, so that if all of a sudden there's a need, uh, we don't have to wait for DNR to open up their warehouse and push us equipment. Right. We can respond a little bit quicker. Um, one of the, the bigger things that we've learned also is what we call our joint reception staging and onward integration process. Um, what we want to make sure that we don't do is send a soldier forward or an airman soldier who has some type of medical issue, right. um, who has some family care issue. Um, maybe, you know, we did get called out in July and they have uh, tickets to go to Disneyland. Right. And so what we want to do is uh, give the commands full flexibility to pull their soldiers and airmen in, figure out, you know, who can go and who can't off of the individuals that are trained as long as they can build those, you know, 10 hand crews, right. you know, we've met the requirement. But then there's moving them to the fire camps and all the associated support to that as well. Um, so again, what we've tried to do is talk to DNR and say, hey, we need at least 24 hours advance notice so that we can notify our service members that, hey, tomorrow you need to be at this location. Right. And then we just start working with uh, the state contracting to get buses and uh, whether it's rental vans, um, you know, commercial buses to move the soldiers to a central location right. um, where we can then process them through. Um, then what we'll do is we have a bus prepared to move them from wherever we're doing our reception and then move them to the fire camps. Once they're at the fire camps, they, they fall completely under the Department of Natural Resources um, sustainment operations. Mm -hmm. So they eat in their dining facilities, they use their gas, um, their laundry facilities, their shower facilities, all of that stuff that you would typically expect at a fire camp, they just fall in on what footprint is existing. What we have found in the past though that works well for us is some of our military vehicles require special uh, tools or equipment, mm -hmm. so then we'll mobilize certain resources to um, help with that. And maintainers. And maintainers, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll also mobilize at, at times <coughs> um, fuelers uh, so that we can continue to fuel um, our fleet. Right. Um, but we're starting to also realize that DNR has credit cards that can also then provide diesel. So why do we you know, push right. a fueler forward? Um, so I guess the takeaway from that is it's never exactly the same. Um, there's you always a little bit of- Just give them a truck and let them fill it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's always a little bit of staff work. Um, like this, this past year in 2018, typically what will happen is they send a uh, hand crew out with, with two sets of uniforms. Okay. Um, one set they're wearing, the other set's you know, in their pack, and then it, when it gets dirty, they can turn that in and get it washed, and then they can um, put on their new set. Um, the fire camps they went to this year, because it was kind of a new tactic that they used, mm -hmm. they did not have the large footprint with the shower and the laundry facilities. Um, so we learned, you know, hey, we gotta start pushing out some new equipment right. and new clothing because it's being soiled. Um, that was something that DNR learned as well with their, their, new, um, their new tactic 
So we're working through, okay, next year, how many right. how many uh, pairs of clothing are we gonna issue out and what's that gonna look like? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. This last year, especially in California, we've seen an enormous fire season. Yep. And in years prior, um, 14 and 15, I believe, we predicted that Washington's will be the biggest it's ever had, and the next year would be the biggest it's ever had, and it's those, those all came true. Are you, are you hearing anything from DNR, like the next couple of years, it's just gonna get worse and worse and worse, or are we? Gonna get some respite? <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> so we typically how do they One, how do they predict that kind yeah. of stuff too, anyways? So they actually have a team, uh, both at DNR and then at the National Incident Fire Center, yeah, NIFSI, in Boise. Mm -hmm. um, and we just got the dates, as a matter of fact, today. Uh, in April, we'll send a team to Boise that will sit through the NIFSI um, pre-coordination meeting. And that's where they, they sit us down and they say, hey, this is the forecast for the Pacific Northwest for fires. This is what we think precipitation is gonna look like. This is what the snowpack looks like. Um, they have imagery that they can use and they show what they call the green up effect. And that's where you know the snow has melted. Now all the buds have come out, the grass has started to grow. And they can actually do a calculation that'll tell them you know, the green up happened here, we'll start to see it all dry out by this time, and then the fire effect will start to take place on this or around this day. This when it stops day. raining. Exactly. <laughs> wow. And so um, we take that data and then that helps us forecast um, what the summer and the fall will look like. Obviously DNR and NIFSI uses that as well, um, but we don't know what 19 really is gonna look like until about the April time frame. Really? Okay. I know there's projections that right. say, hey, you know, 2000 such and such is, probably be the worst year because they're looking at El Nino or what's the other El one? Nina. El, El Nina. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all that associated stuff that they try to forecast it. Um, but that's kind of like to me trying to tell what the weather looks like in July today. Right. Um, wow. So yeah. we really won't know until April. Okay. And then and even then you'll only sort of know. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> right. So maybe you can tell us how hot it's going to be. <laughs> Any other things that we're doing, we're prepping now that we haven't done in the in previous years or previous seasons? Um, nothing that's, that's different. Really, that different since the you know 2016 season because that's the year that we really started to, to pre-train. I guess a couple of things I'll note is um, the the state legislature provides us two hundred thousand dollars a year to train those individuals up mm. uh, prior to the fire season. Um, so that's very forward thinking of our state legislature to, to look at that. Right. Um, the unfortunate reason why that came about was 2014 and 2015 with the large fires that we had and then the amount of time it took us to train. We are the only state that we're aware of that actually pre-trains our hand crews to go fight fires. Everyone else kind of does this just in time training right. and, and that works, um, but you know when houses, communities mm -hmm. and infrastructure are at risk, um, it's easier for us to say, yeah, we can be there in the next 36 hours as opposed to, I can be at a training site in the next 36 hours to go through 40 hours of instruction and then I'll be on the fire lines. Um, so that's one thing that's very unique about Washington and works very well to our advantage. Um, the other thing that I mentioned about earlier is our service members. They, they do a fabulous job, um, especially the ones that have to take the extra week out of, out of their, yeah. their lives to come in and get red card certified. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we, we've worked ourselves to the point where we are the preferred hand crews when we show up because our airmen and soldiers work very hard, they're diligent, um, and, and they just get the job done. So kudos to them and to their, their leadership that gets them trained up and ready to go. Yeah. Do this, does the red card certification help any of the service members maybe on the civilian side as far as like being able to get a job? It does. Um, so I know of at least three um, soldiers that, that went and got red card certified and then applied for um, work uh, with the Department of Natural Resources right. or with the U.S. Forest Service and they have been hired. Um, that's great for them, but then we've got to line them yeah, out on you our kinda, hand crews. <laughs> you can't like just, you know, they get them until you need them yep. and then you send them back out in their National Guard to set us. Yeah. <laughs> that's not how that that's, works. That's, yeah. like, that's like losing a bunch of people to go back yeah. to active duty. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> You know, but if it if it helps yeah. that service member maintain right. a job and stay in the community, yeah, you know, great. We'll continue to do it. Can you speak to the 
uh, proposals that the TAG has at the state legislature at all? Yeah, about the a, a little bit. Um, so what we're trying to do is actually increase the amount of pay for state active duty. Um, one of the things that we have found is we, we send uh, airmen and our soldier out and a lot of times, again, it's our aviation crews that go down to Oregon or other states. Mm -hmm. um, and then as soldiers and airmen will do, they start comparing notes as to how much are you getting paid, how much are you know, I getting paid. And what we found is that um, we, we need to increase the amount of pay that our, our airmen and soldiers receive when they're actually called for state active duty. Um, so this year, we're, we're working that for fires. Um, we'll see what comes of that with the state legislature. Um, they've always been very receptive to date on when we go to them and and actually demonstrate that there's a need and what the benefit is if, if the need is supported. Um, and so right now confidence is high that uh, we'll get that support from the state legislature. Nice, that's hopeful. Yeah. Um, I guess the other thing that might be of interest um, is the Air Guard. So historically the Air Guard has really pr been an enabler. They have the disaster bed down relief um, mm -hmm. system that they set up at, at the fire camps. Um, they've provided all kinds of uh, additional enablers in 14 and 15. Um, but this past year in 18 was really the first time that, that um, I mean, they've provided hand crews in the past, but, but they were able to get hand crews out to the fires. Um, this year, again, five hand crews to the air, five to the Army, and that, that ability to kind of share that, that um, responsibility really helps the organization as a whole so that we're not just continually relying on either one service or one organization to, to go fight fires. So, this is truly a Washington National Guard response. Nice. Joint, interagency, all good. Yes. Yep. Thank you very much for taking the uh, time to speak with us yep. about this. I think uh, it's fascinating stuff, yeah, especially with the whole the weather and the predictive thing. As I just don't know how they do it, but uh, they can predict really big fire seasons. Yep. And uh, it, it just gives us ample time to prepare. and. Yep. I'm surprised that uh, we're the only state that, honestly, that uh, pre-trains yeah. their hand crews. California needs to get on it. <laughs> well, <laughs> California might be a little bit of an exception. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, I don't think they pre-train. They have a, a, a pool that they pull from from time to time. Yeah, that's a, um, but probably experienced people yeah. that have been yeah, doing well, it year they after have, year. Like, all the people, right? So. Yeah, that's true. Anyways. That's an unfair advantage. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, sir, yeah, and uh, we'll talk at you next time. Very good. <laughs>